Exodus chapter 23, part 1. Now, I do want you to pay attention to part 2, okay? And the reason for this is I'm going to start something here in part 1 that I will conclude in part 2. So, bear with me. In chapter 23, it says, You shall not circulate a false report. Now, here's the thing. In the Ten Commandments, it says, You shall not bear false witness. Okay? A lot of people will say, Well, that's, you shall not lie. It, it's more specific than that. Yes, yeah, it's not a good idea to lie. But on the other hand, this is talking about false witnessing. Now, for people today, the, probably the worst thing that could happen to somebody is if you go and tell some false report about somebody, somebody could end up getting fired. Okay, if you stand there and tell somebody that, that uh, let's say we have um, Mary and Jane and uh, there's this boss named Bill. Okay, and let's say Bill is the boss of Mary and Jane. So Mary goes spreading it around that Jane is a thief. Well, the worst, probably, in today's terms, what would happen is that Bill would fire Jane and she'd just be out of a job. Okay. But back in these days, it could be a lot worse. Alright. Now, that's bad enough. But let's say, back in these days, that Mary had spread it around that Jane was a thief. Jane could get banished. She could also be killed for being a thief. Yeah, they could have stoned Jane for being a thief. That's why God said, you shall not circulate a false report. Because what you're doing is you could be condemning somebody to death. That's a bad thing. Now, when you do put somebody out of work because of a false report, you're actually condemning them to a lifetime of suffering, literally. Okay, when somebody is put out of work, especially in these, they can't just go out and suddenly get another job. Especially if they've been accused of being a thief, even if the report is false. They can have a thunder of a time getting another job. And that's all thanks to you. And do you think God's going to hold you guiltless for that? Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. In other words, if somebody goads you to bear a false report so that, say, Jane, what we're talking about here, let's, let's say Mary gets some cohorts together and says, hey, look, we're all going to get together and say Jane's a thief. That way Jane can be executed. God doesn't hold that guiltless. All right, those cohorts, if they cooperate with Mary, they're going to go down with Mary when God judges them. Okay, especially if Jane is stoned to death, or if Jane is unemployed. That's what we're talking about here. And the worst part is that it can be done in a, in a social way just as much as it can be done in a job way. Let's say Mary um, is spreading rumors about Jane's adultery that Jane has nothing to do with. That makes it next to impossible for Jane to even get married. You could end Mary's literal life. You could end Jane's literal life. Okay, you could actually end Jane's literal life because if she doesn't have any offspring, she didn't have anybody to take care of her. All because of rumor that you spread. Get the picture? Now, I know people don't think much of adultery these days, but I'll tell you what, there are some people that really do think highly of that, and that gets to be a problem. So, you could really mess up somebody's life by spreading a rumor, especially if it's a false one. Alright? You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. That means if a crowd is going around and uh, they're stoning somebody to death that you know they shouldn't be stoning, don't stand there and pick up a bunch of rocks and throw it along with them. This is what happened in Germany during World War II. Hitler was telling everybody the Jews were bad. And instead of people discerning whether Hitler was right or wrong, they just joined right in. 
Follow along with the crowd. We don't want to upset them any. We don't want to be the ones being stoned. Ask Stephen the, the, in the book of Acts what he thinks about that. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute, so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. In other words, you don't perjure yourself in court. Because a person's reputation could be on the line because of that. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. In other words, just because he's poor doesn't make him right. No more than it just because you're rich doesn't make you right. That's what we see in courts every day. Uh, settlements given millions of dollars to poor people just because they're poor. It has nothing to do with whether they were telling the truth or lying. They're behinds off. They were poor, so we have to give them money. That's ridiculous. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. In other words, just because you don't like your neighbor doesn't mean you shouldn't be kind to your neighbor. All right, let's let's say um, there's a storm and and uh, your neighbor's house is struck by high winds and some some of the roof caves in on on the neighbor. You don't stand there and watch him die. You go in there and you rescue him. Just because you don't like the guy doesn't mean you don't go rescue him. Okay, you don't have to treat him all the best, but you. It, if you do, it's divine, but you don't have to treat him all the best, but you do have to be decent enough to go rescue him, even if you don't like him. Besides, he might think differently of you if you go in there and rescue him. Alright? You can change a person's opinion pretty quick by just being kind when you don't have to, when you feel you shouldn't have to. When you feel you shouldn't have to, but you do it anyway. Okay? If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. Look, if you see somebody carrying a heavy burden, whether that person's your friend or your enemy, do your best to relieve the burden. That makes you a better person. Even if that enemy of yours doesn't appreciate it, somebody else will. They'll think you have higher character than the other guy. Trust me. You shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. In other words, just because he's poor doesn't mean you don't defend him. If he's got a legitimate case, you defend him regardless of how much money he has. How many times do we see this in court? Well, you're poor, so you're not going to get good rep representation. Guy goes to jail for 30 years because of something he didn't do, only because he got poor representation in court. Remember this, lawyers. God holds you accountable for those that you're, de you're defending. If you're going to stand there and give a lackluster job, it'd be better you didn't at all. Because if you do, God holds you in account. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. You know what that means? If you got a guy and he's lying about his neighbor stealing from him, don't stand there and, and join in with him and say, Hey, yeah, that guy was stealing. You know dang good well that the neighbor wasn't stealing. You stay as far away from that as possible. Matter of fact, what you should do is you def should defend the innocent neighbor against the guy that's lying about him. That's what you're supposed to do. Even if it costs you your life, you're supposed to do that. Alright. 
And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. This is something that was found out during the Prohibition days and the Elliot Ness that stopped Al Capone. Elliot Ness was offered many bribes, but Elliot Ness turned them all down because justice was more important to him than money. When somebody bribes you to ter turn the other way, tell them to keep their money. And I'll explain why later. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Okay. Just because somebody comes away from a far land, let's say somebody comes from Italy to the United States, doesn't give you the right to uh, uh, pay them lower wages. It doesn't give you the right to enslave them. It doesn't give you the right to cheat them. Okay? You pay as much for their wares as you would for anybody else. Just because they come from a foreign country does not mean you get to cheat them. Six years you shall six years you shall sow your land and gather its produce. That means you get your butt up out of that chair and six years in a row you plow your fields, you plant your seeds, and when the crop comes in you don't waste any time and gather your crops. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive garden. What that means is that your soil needs that seventh year to rejuvenate itself. It, it can put life into plants for six years and then it needs time to rest so that it, it can uh, rejuvenate and do it again. And you'll see this with farmers today. You'll be driving down the road and you'll see one field full of crops but then you'll see the next field and it'll be totally empty. What they're doing is they're rotating the land. That's why they buy lots of acreage. So they plow certain fields and then they leave other ones alone. That way they have a constant supply of food. Alright? Because God set up a pattern. Six days you shall work, seventh you rest. Six years your, your fields will give you crops, seventh year they won't. That's God's idea, not yours. And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let they be heard from your mouth. What that means is, don't worship other gods. You're trusted on God himself. Don't go and try to trust other gods. Alright. Now that's going to conclude Exodus chapter 23 part 1. I will tell you more in my next video, so stay tuned.